I met Joe uh, first time in high school. I was 17. Uh, it was actually a job interview, and I didn't know how scared I was supposed to be. And I think now, uh, now we all know. Uh, he lives Machiavelli's words about safer to be feared than, than loved uh, to the to the T. Um, I, Joe and I walked into the same event uh, one day, and it was not a political event, but the speaker was uh, Linda Lingle, uh, Governor Linda Lingle, who was the, at the time, governor of the state of Hawaii, which I'm sure as many of you know is the, is the birthplace of our current president. And uh, the nature of the event, the nature of the speaker, the nature of the location, it said, you know, just didn't really add up that I would see Joe. Joe would see, I think he was probably thinking the same thing about me. And so we looked at each other and he, I didn't say anything and he looked at me and he said, are you here to ask her for the birth certificate too? <laughs> Which only makes the point that, uh, that uh, no one escapes Joe. Uh, his capacity for uh, brilliance, quite frankly, both of a, of a political and policy nature, but, but also his capacity uh, for humor and the, the spirit of New Hampshire. New Hampshire would be a different place if not for Joe. Uh, having said that, uh, when we realized, you know, we're trying to think who can talk about Joe, who can be our featured speaker, which it's my honor to, to bring up in a moment. Uh, you know, it's very hard to not find someone who hasn't been wounded in some way uh, by, I mean, it's a really small list, and in fact, Joe is an institution, and the reason he's an institution is because so many of the people he's focused on have been institutionalized to recover from. Uh, so we decided, well, why don't we, we're going to own that. We're going we're to own the victim thing, and, uh, and uh, that, that certainly brings back, brings back uh, m memories of, of WMUR. Uh, but that's not really why Carl is here. Uh, Carl is here because we love him to death. Uh, a lot of us know Carl from, from those days. And when, uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard to say Carl because in my office when the TV's on and, and Carl comes on, it's not Carl, it's Carl, right? It's Carl, that's who we know. And knowing somebody makes all the more accessible the work they do, right? I mean, you relate more to the work they do. And Carl, uh, who is one of the gorgeous people I told you about, I mean, and, uh, but it's also his job to look, to look gorgeous. He, um, you know, he makes his living very similarly to, uh, you know, the best analogy I can think of is those, those wildlife uh, adventure reporter people, Marlon Perkins, uh, Jack Hanna, these folks who, you know, they, they make their living by, by edging up to certain territory and then explain it to you. And, you know, kind of creeping up on the bushes, like, you know, see Carl around the Capitol, you know, and the Capitol's behind him, and he explains this, this arcane species to you, you know, just like Jack Hanna. And the worst things that can happen to both people in Carl's role and the, you know, Jack Hanna, Marlon Perkins types, is that the animal that they're studying does nothing or does things that you can't show or talk about on television or in front of your kids or that sort of thing. And Carl's great accomplishment is not looking nauseous when he covers some of the things he has to cover. Rather, he finds a way to find beauty in some of the most ridiculous political situations ever and relating it to us, and we're grateful for that as well. There is a bio on your, on your uh, place settings that tell you about all, all the laudatory things Carl has done. Um, but he's here because uh, we have to keep reminding ourselves what a big deal he really is now and how lucky we are to have him back and uh, how downright anxious I am to hear what he has to say about our honoree. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a dear friend of the Josiah Bartlett Center and all of us, Carl Kahn.
All right, now I'm a little bit nauseous. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It's nice to be home. Uh, and I had done research to make sure I got the dates and the history of Joe correctly. And it's all in the pamphlet, and you've heard it way better than anything I could possibly do. I was even clever enough to say that when Joe says that he's from third, three generations of newsmen, you've got to count Katie, and there's now four. And depending on your history and reading of it, there's some folks who say that was a great-grandfather who was the engraver who, who, who was actually, maybe some of that ended up and got published. So it's not just Joe. He comes from a long, long lineage of reporters. Rich, that was very nice, completely untrue. Uh, but very generous, and I am really thrilled to be here, and I'm really happy that Steve, Governor Merrill, said some of the things that he said, because he referenced that if I was going to be there, maybe Joe wouldn't. And, and I, have to, I have to explain a little bit about my relationship to the union leader, to its president, in many ways more importantly to Joe's wife, and, and how I got into all this. Uh, I started at WFEA Radio in Manchester in the late 80s. And uh, I read the Union Leader every day. I wanted to know what they were covering, who they were covering, how they were covering, and why they were covering stuff. It was the statewide newspaper, and it was clearly the narrative. It was the gospel. He wrote the history books. The first line of the first, write, the first writing of history, they say, is by the reporters the Union Leader was doing. And at FEA and ZID, in those days, it was when radio was changing, it was downsizing. People were being let go, and automation was happening. So we went from a newsroom at WFEA, and those of you who are old enough, there was people like Ken Kale, who's here tonight, and Conrad Kane, and Con Tom Calici, and a bunch of folks who were just real denizens of radio for a long, long time, and they all got kind of vanished in a lot of ways, and I ended up being a one-man newsroom for two radio stations. So I relied heavily on the union leader and began to see how it made me think. I'd read the newspaper and I'd see something. It wasn't the headline usually. It was the second or third sentence that made, you, made me realize, oh, that's what the next step is. Oh, that's what journalism is meant to do. It's to, meant to, to see the next part of the equation, see around the corner. Know enough today to make good decisions tomorrow. And I was a competitor. I, I, was, I was very much trying to learn and be competitive. Well, after I would get up at 1 o'clock in the morning in order to get from Hooksit over to Manchester to the studios down in, in, the, in the mill yard. And I'd go on the air at 5 a.m. and I'd get off at 9. And at 9, I changed from being the news guy to being the public affairs director for these two radio stations which really translated to, I was the kid driving the van that towed around the big red boom box that to this day you'll see at events in New Hampshire. And I drove it everywhere, every day. And we were going to nonprofit events and charity events and doing anything we possibly could, mostly just to get the big boom box in front of everybody's face. But it introduced me to uh, the, a community in New Hampshire that I had never really touched before. And I'm, my family's been in New Hampshire for 120 years. And that's where I met Signe McQuaid. I was watching what Joe and his team at the Union Leader put out every day, and sometimes doing the opposite, sometimes mimicking it. But I met Signe, and she was involved in so many things, and I would run across her every day, and she was always nice, and she was always pleasant. And, I, and, I, and I, at the time, I thought, wow, this is, she was really exciting, and she knew everybody, and everybody loved her, and obviously it was because she was engaged, but it was also because of Joe. And, I had this kind of a weird public affairs community service crush on Signe. And, and it said something about Joe to me, that, 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 that the guy who was creating this paper and tormenting politicians of every stripe, uh, and with the history of the paper and everything else. And it meant something. So FEA days go on. I got up to the state house as a news guy, and the first person I was told to go see by the folks at FEA and ZID was Don Tibbetts. He was the dean of the press corps in those days. And Don was busy, and, and I, was in, I was a pain in the neck, and he told me things. Most of them were true. Most of them were really helpful. Most of them were the kind of shortcuts that a kid who wanted to make a difference and hoped to do it right needed. And it mattered because it was Don Tibbetts. And when people saw Don talking to me, 
guys like Kevin Landrigan at the, at the National Telegraph and others began to take me seriously. The guys at the AP began to take me seriously. They really weren't accustomed to seeing anybody from radio up there other than maybe GIR occasionally. So, I respected what Signe was doing and I wanted to mimic, mimic what the paper was doing. It told me what Signe was about, a lot of what made Joe tick. Everybody knew he was brutally candid. Everybody knew the paper could slay you in a heartbeat. And presidential candidates were incredibly deferential to him. I was a lowly radio guy, and I was lucky to get any attention. And as the years went on, we got up to about 1991, 92. And I was doing the election night coverage in 1990. And I asked a couple of lawyers in Manchester if they would be my election night analysts. Uh, the Democrat was John Broderick, and he became a really important source for me because he and George Bruno and Terry Shoemaker hooked me up with a guy named Bill Clinton when he came to New Hampshire a year and a half later. And that made a difference for me professionally, but it also left an impression on me with particularly John Broderick because he became a very close friend. And the Republican was Steve Merrick. And they did my radio show and they did the talk stuff, and I had an in with a guy who was later going to be governor and a guy who was later going to become not just a Supreme Court ju justice up there, but uh, judge up there, but, but also hooked me up with the Clintons. And the relationship with Steve and John over the years became more and more important to me and to FEA and ZID, and ultimately it was to Channel 9 as well, because Steve was the lawyer for Channel 9. When, when he joked about how Joe wouldn't be in the room if I was there, imagine how the governor of New Hampshire felt as the former lawyer for the TV station and the neighbor two houses down from the editor of the newspaper, the manager of the newspaper, the publisher of the newspaper after 2000. And, and we batted him around like a ping pong ball. The union leader at Channel 9 took Steve Maller, Merrill and we played him back and forth we had images and we would have discussions about what we imagined what was happening up at the union leader. McQuaid's going to call up Merrill at home tonight and he's going to just rip him on this, that, and the other thing and demand that he does this, that, and the other. And if he does, then we'll crush him tomorrow night at six. <laughs> and and we, would, we would go back and forth with these sorts of things and it got kind of nasty. There was a, there was a, there was a time when Channel 9 decided that it didn't want to be the station of Uncle Gus anymore and wanted to have serious news. And Larry Gilpin and Jack Heath were the sort of the, the guys behind the scenes making stuff go. And I was but a lowly servant soldier, but off on the tip of the spear. And there was a point where ABC News, those of you, if, you don't, if you're too young to remember this, you'll have to Google it, but there was an ABC show called NYPD Blue a long time ago. ABC did it. And it was really a groundbreaker. It was one of the first primetime TV stations, TV network channels, shows, to ever put cuss words, I mean, honest to God, swearing on TV, and partial nudity. Across the country, there were a number of socially conservative organizations that took great offense to this show. And we f woke up one morning to find demonstrators in our parking lot because the union leader had found some in New Hampshire and dispatched them to our parking lot. We were absolutely convinced that this was the beginning of the union leader's persecution of us for being an ABC affiliate and putting on what we had no choice to put on. And it went on and on and on and on. Front page pictures, front page art of the, of the demonstrations. Sometimes it looked like there must have been an early fisheye 3D camera because there were so many people in our parking lot. It wasn't, wasn't that big. And, and, there, and we would look for ways to, to tweak back. We'd, we'd, we'd call the governor and threaten not to put him on the air for a couple of days and that was guaranteed to get news from that particular governor. Uh, and we would occasionally look for ways to point out that it was the Manchester Union leader instead of the New Hampshire Union leader. And we just imagined that that drove them crazy up there, so we would say it twice. <laughs> and we were New Hampshire's News 9, and they were Manchester's Union leader. And of course, the name had come off a long time ago. But that was the kind of stuff that we thought was really important behind the scenes in this great titan battle of the media. And Channel 9 was young and new and... So there came a time when 35 Amherst Street was going to be closed down and Industrial Park was going to open where you guys were going to move up the hill. And 
uh, we came across a series of stories. I don't remember the exact origin of, of what the information was, but the time came and the union leader, you guys gave us, a, all the media got a great tour of the property. And we walked through it, went into the basement, we looked at this thing and it was gonna be the big move and what was gonna happen to the building and where it might go. And, and I did not report this, but it started on the air that, well, you know, with all the ink in the basement of 35 Amherst Street, maybe there's some super fun toxic dumping going on there and maybe the building would be hard to sell. And that got on Channel 9, and, and boy, did it get tough. The, the editorials got a little bit nastier. I don't think Larry Gilpin ever got named, but MUR was all over the front page for weeks. Fast forward, 1992, the union leader did something absolutely astounding. It, excuse me, 80, yeah, 92. In 1992, the union leader endorsed Pat Buchanan. It was huge. A sitting vice president of the United States is gonna to come to the first of the nation primary state and the state's largest newspaper was endorsing somebody else. Pat Buchanan, of course, 38%. It was unquestionably a big part of the union leader's support and the influence and the power of the paper and of Signe for her role with Buchanan, and, and of Joe for the editorials that you, the Naki initially, and then you wrote in, in 96, went through the roof. Everybody in the country knew that the union leader was potentially gonna start picking presidents. Reminds me of the Sununu line about Iowa where I spend way too much time first in the nation of voters. Uh, you know, New Hampshire picks president, so Iowa picks corn. Um, <laughs> the, I could go on for hours and hours about First of the Nation politics. You know, I, I, I will defend my objectivity as a reporter on every story, with the exception of First of the Nation politics. I am a dyed-in-the-wool, out-and-out partisan when it comes to Iowa and New Hampshire. Iowa is under fire. If they can take down the Iowa caucus, as quirky and as weird as it is, then New Hampshire could be threatened too. And there's a rumor going around that the Republican Party might be willing to badmouth Iowa into irrelevance this year. That's not necessarily good for first in the nation states. Iowa does something different, and being different is merit. It, it is worth being being heard and seen. Uh, I digress. So, Pat Buchanan's second run for president started in late 1994, 95, really, and he comes up here and. We did a bunch of stories about him, and I got what is the crowning union leader editorial of my time working for Channel 9. I never got it, no, no, I didn't get any hate mail. I, I actually won a ton of awards when I was a radio guy at FEA and ZID. Never got any accolades at all in New Hampshire, but the premier one was suitable for framing, and I did. It was an editorial that followed essentially MUR's coverage of the Buchanan campaign, and I don't remember the headline, but I do remember the first sentence and the second sentence. The first sentence started out describing me as a ham-handed meat axe reporter. <laughs> now, this is, a, this, is, this is a long time ago. This is like 20 years ago almost. Back in those days, being a ham-handed meat axe reporter to some people was actually a compliment because we were coming off of the guys like Sam Donaldson. Who, who got off on like getting in the president's face and being rude and sometimes asking good questions but sometimes being unnecessarily showboat about it. So that, were, that was like one of those curses that was a blessing. Hey, maybe I'm as good as Sam Donaldson. Oh, I'm as good as Sam Donaldson? No, not, not, not so. And the next one was, the next phrase was just describing me and this, is, and, and this is why I framed it. And it's why I put it in a frame on the door in the basement in my bathroom. <laughs> I was labeled a sewer pipe of filth. <laughs> Great line. And, and I am in no, at the time I was a little bit shocked, a lot shocked, but then I realized that everybody had gotten those editorials. And of course the editorial that the paper is most famous for probably is the Muskie. Not the editorial, but the story. And I know, at least I, I, I may get this wrong, Joe, I've heard this story a ton of times, so shout it out and correct me as you, only you will. But you edited that story, right? The headline? No, I edited Muskie, Right, it was low, Muskie, 
calls Loeb liar. Right, okay, good, yeah. So Joe edited that and brought it to William Loeb III for approval or disapproval or a lashing or something. And the story goes that Loeb looked at it and said something along the lines of, what? He's worried about what some little newspaper in New Hampshire says? I don't think I want that guy's finger on the button or in charge or being in the Oval Office or the President. And Joe went out and printed it and history there it was. And Joe McQuaid headline took it to William Loeb. Now everybody says William Loeb did it, but, but Joe was there. If I live through it, 16 will be my eighth presidential campaign, starting in 88, going to, six, going to 16. I figure you've got to be up to at least 15 professionally covering them, which is remarkable. I mean, it says in your, in your pamphlets there that Joe started as a, as a sort of a copy boy and his first gig was a sports writer. But that means that you were there watching it professionally. He has met countless candidates, even some fringe candidates. Uh, here's another piece of Joe. You know, J Joe McQuaid is a fun fact of New Hampshire, so that just consider this a gift of trivia. He was threatened by a presidential candidate. And not just any kind of fringe candidate. This was a celebrity fringe candidate, all right? Now again, you, so you're too young, you have to Google it and look it up, but Billy Jack threatened to break Joe's arms, right? Tom Laughlin, the, the actor who ran in, I think it was 92, um, up against Clinton and Steve Merrill, so, you know, hard billing. And, and, and you know, he was one of these fringe guys, and he can't, he, he, so, what, what Joe has done in presidential politics, in state politics, Steve, you have, you're absolutely right about income taxes and, and sales taxes, has been exacting, unforgiving, unapologetic, and, and a model for what reporters should be. Because the paper is conservative, people assume that the journalism is conservative. But I've known an awful lot of union leader reporters. We've been friends and collegial competitors over the years. And I know from their t stories, and they have been uniform from Tibbetts on, that Joe doesn't take any BS. He treats everybody the same. My network says, fair and balanced, we report you decided it's supposed to not be balanced. It's supposed to not, we're supposed to be fighting imbalance. Joe holds people to a standard. And you see it in the news copy. It can be a fire-breathing editorial right next to it. But the facts matter. And, and you said he does it, Steve, you were saying he does it for the people of New Hampshire. I'm not so sure. I think, I think sometimes when you read what Joe writes and you see what the family does and you see what they stand for and the way it's sort of interwoven into all that's New Hampshire, I think it's really bigger than that. I mean, like it or not, Joe, you are part of what is New Hampshire now and have been for a long, long time. Uh, this room doesn't even begin to scratch the surface to the number of people whose lives you've touched that it's difficult to see. You sit on high and even though you're a regular guy, you don't know how much it means. You had no idea how I felt about your wife and how I felt about you from a difference, from a distance. And there were days where I'm sure the whole staff just wallowed in your rants about what jerks everybody at MUR were. Totally, totally Legitimate. Joe loves New Hampshire. You can feel it. He has helped define it. For, the, for, for, for even, even the most liberal Democrats, even people who've run against the candidates that the union leader has endorsed, have a begrudging respect for Joe's challenge to them to think. If you don't know Joe, you might think that he's got a kind of a weird or no sense of humor because he can be totally stone-faced and throw a fastball by you, and if you're not up with it, it's not, it's, it, A, it's probably very funny, and B, he wants to know if you're paying attention. I know that that's how he treated his report, he treats his reporters, and I know that that's how he treats people and friends. He wants us to be better granite staters. He wants the state to live up to our ideals. You know, when I, when I moved away from New Hampshire 20 years ago, and I come back all the time, my folks are still up in East Wakefield, the, the one thing I was worried about was Washington. And it took two and a half years before somebody, that's actually my sort of my boss, Britt Hume, who said, well, what's up with you? And I said, I just don't feel comfortable around here. I mean, love the job, love the, love the news, love the journalism, love the chase, but eh, I want to get out on the road. I don't like being in the office. He said, well, what the hell are you thinking? You just came from the live free or die state of New Hampshire. You're now in the belly of the beast of Washington. Of course you're not comfortable. Joe challenges people to see the obvious not to overlook it, to take things at face value and then look beyond that and think.
come to conclusions and advance the state. It's not just the Manchester Union leader. It's not just the New Hampshire Union leader. In fact, people in New Hampshire don't understand how feared Joe McQuaid is by presidential candidates yet to even decide. <laughs> they know that they're going to have to come and talk to Joe sooner or later. Uh, I don't, I don't know. That, is, there, is, is, there any, is there any major candidate that you've not met, Joe? Did anybody ever stiff you, not show up? Yeah, well, Steve Merrill, of course. <laughs> the, he's got a reputation for being a feisty newsman, but what he has done for the union leader, by the way, it's not a, t it's not a good industry. It's a tough industry to work in. Those who don't know what, what Joe and the folks up there are doing to keep that paper going and keep that paper here, because it, it, what would the primary be like? What would New Hampshire be like? I mean, I have to confess, I live a long way away, so I don't have it mailed to me. I read the paper on, online. If I lived in New Hampshire, I would feel guilty about reading the paper online, because I'd want to buy it and make sure that they can keep going. There's... <laughs> doesn't mean you have to agree. That's the whole point. It's not about, it's not about agreement. It's about education, information, and making decisions as a state. And it's changed a heck of a lot. I mean, when I left, it was 88% Republican. I mean, the legislature was, was all Republican. And, and, and now it's changed over a couple times more. He's a hardworking Granite Stater. I was going to say as, as indispensable as the old man, but that doesn't work anymore, right? The Josiah Bartlett was the fourth governor, a signer of the Declaration. That's a good award for Joe McQuaid to have. He is independent. He doesn't take any guff from anybody. And like it or not, you're a leader. Not the first, but a good one. And, you know, we're all lucky to have him. And, and as a former adversary and secret admirer, I can tell you, anybody is happy to tell you when we disagree with you. But one thing that I'm proud to say is, Thank you very much for all that you've done and will continue to do, Joe. It's been incredibly important for me as an individual and for everybody in this room and the state, whether they want to admit it or not. Thank you.